All right, so our first presenter is Mariette Pathy Allen. Mariette has been photographing the transgender community for over 40 years. Through her artistic practice, she's been a pioneering force in gender consciousness, contributing to numerous cultural and academic publications about gender variants and lecturing throughout the globe. Her first book, Transformations, Crossdressers and Those Who Love Them, was groundbreaking in its investigation of a misunderstood community. Her other books include The Gender Frontier, Trans Cuba, and her newest book, Transcendence, Sp Spirit Mediums in Burma and Thailand. Marriott's life work is being archived by Duke University's Rare Book and Manuscripts Library and the Sally Bingham Center for Women's Studies. She's been exhibited internationally and it is in the collection of many public and private collections. And her work has been featured widely on both the SDN website and in Zeke magazine. Okay, Mariette, why don't you unmute yourself and um, get started. Yes, hello, Glenn and everybody. I'm very happy to be here. <clears throat> and um, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about how I got involved with the trans community and then show you some images. I um, had always been interested in questions of gender and identity and um, self-definition. And so when I encountered <clears throat> the trans community, um, I felt like I had found a home of sorts because here I was with the people who were um, having the same questions as I did. So one day I was in New Orleans for Mardi Gras, the last day of Mardi Gras, and happened to stay in the same hotel <clears throat> as a group of cross-dressers. I came downstairs for breakfast and <clears throat> I was invited to join them. They were incredible looking people. It was, it was almost noon and sun was shining. And so I joined them for breakfast. And right after breakfast um, at this hotel, there was, that was on the first floor and there was a swimming pool right, so, right outside of the dining room. And suddenly they all left and started um, forming a line around the swimming pool. And one person started taking pictures. And I thought, I wonder if it's okay for me to take a picture. I mean, I'm a total outsider. But I thought, well, if nobody stops me, I might as well. So I took the camera and put it before I looked through it. And I noticed that there were nine people and one person was looking straight back at me. And I felt like um, I was looking into a soul rather than a man or a woman. And I kind of felt like I had made an amazing discovery for myself. And I made, it, what happened is that I ended up making friends with one of those um, cross-dressers who turned out to live 20 blocks away from me in New York City. And it was through her, Vicki West, that I came to uh, know the community. And, um, and it grew and grew. And so this was in 1978. And I'm still with the community, taking pictures and involved. So let me tell you what I've been, how I started and some of the images. What I wanted to show that was that cross-dressers and transgender people and the whole variation of um, gender uh, variant and nonconformist and expansive people were totally relatable and were not the freaks that have been depicted up till now. Would, people could not find pictures of themselves in that they could relate to. Uh, mostly the images were in porn shops 
or in medical offices where it was about studying them. So early on, I looked for um, trans people who would be willing to show, be seen with their families and children, and of course with each other. And this was perhaps my is perhaps my favorite picture of a crossdresser with her daughter, Paula and Rachel. Um, this is another one of my favorite uh, pictures from the early days. These are from the 80s. Um, this is Valerie, and we had been doing, we're on the dunes of Province in Provincetown. And um, during something called Fantasia Fair, which is the oldest um, cross-dressing um, conference. Um, so Valerie and I, we went up to the dunes, which of course isn't legal, but never mind. Um, and photographed all practically all day. And um, she brought all kinds of clothing with her. But at the end of the afternoon, it started getting really cold and Valerie grabbed her coat and I felt like um, this coat was like a stuffed animal. And she was to me like a child full of longing um, holding her stuffed animal. Uh, this is a person who, um, people seem to be very interested these day, days. Alu, um, Sullivan. Hmm? Lou Sullivan. Sullivan, Lou Sullivan. Um, he um, was an F to M, female to male, transsexual. In other words, he lived full time as Lou. And he there was so much uh, talk about sexual orientation. Um, well, I guess there still is. Um, so Lou continued to be interested in men, even through transition, and um, was had a very sexual, active sexual life. Um, one of the points he was trying to make is that unlike the way the um, <coughs> the medical establishment <coughs> um, seemed to want things to be, is that after your transition, you were supposed to be in a hetero heterosexual relationship. So Lou was supposed to be, therefore, in a relationship with a woman. Um, but he wanted to let people know that that's not necessarily the case, that you could be in a relationship with anybody. Um, and uh, Lou ultimately died of, of AIDS. But before that, he had established a female to male F to M um, journal, had written some books, and uh, was had trained the person you're going to see Next, this is James Green, who has carried on the tradition, not necessarily the sexual orientation of Lou because he's married and has a wonderful wife. But James Green has been, I, I would say he's the best known F to M at this point and has lectured all over the globe um, has been in numerous films, and um, as you can see from the picture, he's an absolutely charming person. He was the head of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health for a number of years, and in the olden days, this organization was essentially for professionals, all kinds of medical people and therapists and surgeons and you name it. And trans people, the people they were supposed to be helping 
were not included in the administration of this organization. So this was a breakthrough as well. Anyway, James, um, here he's sitting at lunch at Fantasia Fair. And here's another person sitting at lunch at Fantasia Fair. This is Virginia Prince, who was, I would say, the, one of the most important people ever in the trans world. Um, Virginia uh, started out sending uh, magazines through the Postal Service. And that in those days, the content was considered prurient and she got in some uh, trouble over it. But anyway, she was determined that, that she could reach other people who felt as she did. She even started something called the Hose and Heels Club, where members could come, but the only thing that they could do was take off their male men's shoes and put on high heels. But the, the idea was that they couldn't um, out each other. Um, they couldn't cross-dress completely. They're just their legs. <laughs> um, after that, she started another organization um, that was for cross-dressers only. No, um, no transsexuals, no people with uh, different orientation, sexual orientation, because her feeling was that she wanted an organization where the wives would feel safe. And in the early days, many of the partners, mostly it was wives, um, were very anxious about this whole phenomenon. They feared that their husbands were uh, gay or that they were going to go the transsexual route. And they always said, well, I married a man. So, you know, what's, what's happening here? Um, one of the purposes of Transformations, my first book, was to create something where um, trans people could be um, relatable and a, a book that could be shown to family and friends and where they could be presented in a way that was positive not necessarily sitting there smiling by any means, but living life in some satisfactory way. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is a good example of it. This is Tiffany and her crying twins. She um, was married to a woman and they had already had one child and then they had twins to their surprise. And you can see, um, I sometimes think of this as migrant mother, but um, um, anyway, it was um, very difficult for them raising three children, but um, they did it, the children have grown up pretty much and are doing very well. And I have photographed Tiffany over many, many years. Um, and she herself is a political activist and was also a member of um, the, the court. And if you've heard of the court, these are uh, gay men who donate to many causes. And they have, they have a court, so they have a king and a queen and uh, subjects, and they travel around and perform. And so, and so Tiffany, um, who clearly is not a gay man, uh, joined the court. And as you might be able to see from this, it's very beautiful and 
had a great time with the court, but she is a political activist on her own and has always been. <laughs> Oops, we're oh. missing a piece here. <clears throat> I've had, I've made a few diptychs and um, <laughs> um, my assistant is here, thank goodness, helping out. Um, I can speak about Delia anyway. I should still be able to see the whole thing. Can can you see the whole image? Yeah. Just see the two no. images. Yeah. All right. Great. Because I, I can't. Okay. Well, Delia was somebody I met at Fantasia Fair. I've gone to many other conferences, but that's been my, um, the one I've gone to the most. Delia is a cross-dresser and also a performance artist and um, sort of a Jill of all trades. She's an expert on cars. Anyway, here we are, bright daylight, and Delia is stretched out in her red sequin dress, which sort of became symbolic. I re-photographed Delia just a few years ago. And as you see, and she was thrilled she could still get into her red sequin dress. And I tried to imitate sort of an unusual pose, um, although I couldn't ask her to be upside down. Um, Delia is leading a satisfactory life. A lot of what she might have wanted hasn't come about, but she's um, at peace and earns a living as an expert on cars. So, and can rebuild them. Deanna, um, again, this is somebody I met actually in the eighties through, I, I've worked on a number of films and this was Lee Grant's What Sex Am I film. And Deanna was very active in that film. And again, um, I'm again speaking of Crossdresser. Um, she was gorgeous as Deanna and rather sad as Joe, but had to work as Joe full time um, to survive. She has a son and, um, but no wife at, at this point. And I always was very fond of Deanna and again, went to see her last year, two years ago. And here she is, you get to see her again as an elderly lady who flies kites. Um, so mostly I photographed her in the process of flying kites. And this picture is the one she likes best. So that's why I'm using it. And also I wanted to mention that when I can, I photograph people in their own environments or outdoors um, because that feels right to me. I look for places where the people I photograph will be comfortable and where they can relate to uh, whatever it is that they're doing and feeling. Okay, I assume you can see all three pictures, right? Again, yeah. thank you. Yeah, okay. So this is an, a wonderfully complicated story. This is Tony, who, as you can see, uh, was a woman who lived in Florida and uh, worked ultimately as a sheriff in Florida. Um, this is out in sort of um, the murky area of Florida, um, the swamps. And it was a very playful time. She was swinging from trees and just playing in the mud, I would say. After a few years, she became part of an activist group that I was involved with as well. But And that's when she learned that 
she could transition and live as a man. And so I'm showing you Tony having transitioned. I, I have photographed every one of Tony's surgeries, which has been, uh, a, has been a fascinating situation. And it occurs to me that the only two really happy surgeries are, surgeries, I'm sorry, events like surgeries or uh, beginnings of life are birth when, and people are generally speaking quite happy about the birth of a baby and the transformation of a transgender person. And because they too are sort of starting a new life and finding who they feel they are. So I, I'm telling you because I took a trip um, recently to visit my old friends. And this is Tony now. This is a photograph taken in Paris. And um, Tony still with it, still active, um, and is trying to find an editor for her fascinate his fascinating life. I look at the first picture and I suddenly say her. But anyway, it's very, this is very much a, a man. Um, so Tony worked as a sheriff, worked in a band that that traveled to Belgium, went to school in Louisiana, um, and lived in New Orleans. And in the early days was was thrown out of a lot of police cars because he refused to wear three pieces of of women's clothing and that was the law then you could not you could not um be anybody who you the you weren't born as okay Marriott, just a time check. Um, can, can you wrap it up in about yeah. two minutes? How many? Two, two to three. Uh, sorry, but uh, I know you uh, must have a lot of work to uh, present here. All right, I, I can do that. Um, this I'll just say who the people are because I have two pictures, one from Cuba, one from um, Transcendence Spirit Mediums in Burma and Thailand. And um, we don't have to go into those stories uh, necessarily. Okay, this is John, and he's a librarian. And it, it, I show this picture to see, to show how um, people, many people are not comfortable now with who they are. You can see that um, John has had surgery from female to male. Um, and uh, is successful person. And let, why don't we run, if you don't mind, I'll run through uh, these two, but I won't really talk about them. It's so this is the work. It's, it's really wonderful work. Uh, so this is Malu in Cuba with her family. And I can talk so much on this that I won't. <laughs> and the next one is the last one is a spirit medium in uh, Burma, who um, is a very important spirit medium, sleeps with the kitten and the rat, and um, makes these um, headdresses that are very important for spirit mediums. Okay. Well, thank you. Um... I love that last picture of the cat. It was an adorable photo of the cat. But all your pictures are, are, are really outstanding and it's a very um, compelling story. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We have time for one question for Mariette. Would anybody like to ask a question before we move on? And we'll have time at the end as well. And if you would like to ask a question, just unmute yourself. But if there are no questions, uh, we could just move on to the next speaker. Okay, our next presenter is Gerard H. Gaskin, a native of Trinidad and Tobago. His book, Legendary 
Inside the House and Ballroom Scene was published in 2013 from Duke University Press. As a freelance photographer, his work is widely published in newspapers and magazines in the United States and abroad, including the New York Times, Newsday, Politican, Black Enterprise, Ebony, Teen People, Caribbean Beat, and Inc. Magazine. Gaskin's photographs have been featured in solo and group exhibitions across the country and abroad. His work is represented in the permanent collections at Duke University, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the National Museum of African American History, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, among others. In 2002, he was awarded the New York Foundation for the Art Artist Fellowship for Photography. Okay, Gerard. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again um, for being part of this thing. Um, I'm I'm going to start, um, I mean, I've, uh, for the last, gosh, now 30 years, actually, it started out as my uh, senior project in college, and now it's turned into 30 years of my life. I've photographed the house and ballroom scene um, that was kind of started here, oh, not here, but in the New York City area, mainly in Harlem. But I want to start with a video um, that I would say one of the most important um, still living um, ballroom people, a guy named Junior LaBeja. And Junior LaBeja is also the narrator in the film Paris is Burning. Um, so I'm going to go there right away. Um, she said uh, options. I put that video clip thing. And so is everyone, can everyone see the screen? Um, yeah, we're seeing it fine. Okay, good. All right. Harlem, 1987. The Apollo Theater. Wiltsmore Paradox. New Jack City. Angel Dust. Heroin. Cocaine. Speedball. Volumes. May Koch. Mm. Welfare, food stamps, EBT, Methadone Alley, Chinese Food Lane. We came from that. We had our parents, some loved us and some abandoned us. We dumped fists, sticks, knives, guns. We were beaten, abandoned, raped, sodomized, criticized, dehumanized. Neglected, rejected, fucked up, fuck you, go on. And yet we had the resilience and the brilliance to get done to go to the Elks Lodge. <laughs> 400 people would go to the Elks Lodge through St. Nicholas Projects, pre Crips, pre Bloods. And we went through their cunty. <laughs> Mascara it out. Maybe it's Maybelline. Ooh, maybe it's a color girl. But we did it because one thing that we shared in that ballroom, and that was love. Not the houses, not the mothers, not the fathers, but love. And we had, we had, and I admit this, we had nerve. nerve. We was defiant. Exactly. We were also brilliant, intellectual, philosophical, shady, fierce. You know when I said, shake the dice and steal the rice? Never forget when you was hungry. That's why you steal the rice, because you can cook rice anywhere and eat it with anything. We're not going to be shady, just fierce. If you don't have the answer, better to assume that you're stupid than to open your mouth and remove all that. Exactly. <laughs> I am. Are we playing basketball now? Oh my God, no. Stop, 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 stop. 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 Uh, We're still love Asia. So then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna show you my pictures. Um, oops, wrong thing, pop. Slideshow. Play. There you go. 
Sure, uh, you want to stop sharing and re -sh Oh, no, that's fine. I'm sorry. This yeah. Is fine. yeah. Yeah. Um, what I would say, uh, ballroom or modern day ballroom started with this woman. The name is Christian, Crystal Labeja. Uh, a lot of times, if anyone has ever seen Paris is Burning, one of the things that Paris is Burning said uh, in in the in the video, especially Pepe Labeja says, is that um, this uh, I'm not the originator. Um, Crystal was the originator, and Crystal um, started the house and ballroom scene because there was a actually a really famous documentary that you can actually go on YouTube and see called The Queen. And she felt that she was being discriminated against back in the 1960s, 65, 66, 67. And then she then started the house and ballroom scene in Harlem, what we consider modern day house and ballroom scene. Um, and I, I'm just going to show some pictures. Actually, this is me and a friend of mine, named Monet, um, that um, when I first started the project, um, before I ha had no hair and just a lot of gray. Um, I, like I said, I was a senior in college at the time at Hunter College in New York. Um, I'm going to show you some photographs from my book. Uh, and then I'm going to show you some photographs from my new project that I call Iconic. So in the ballroom scene, there's literally three categories or four categories. Um, what well, we would consider uh, transgender women, um, uh, male, transgender men, gay men, and what we would say women or, or gay women, right? Uh, and it's, uh, and then they have categories with all of those categories that then play with the idea on ultimately how the fluidity of queerness looks like. So there'll be moments when uh, people cross dress, but also then there are times when they want to show that in one way they can cross dress, and then in the next way they can they can dress up like they're going to uh, work in a suit and a tie, or and then after that then do voguing or dance the dance that this scene also created. So I'm gonna sh I'll show some pictures and then. You know, you guys can kind of ask me questions at the end.
So after my book came out in 2013, I kind of started thinking about ultimately what else I wanted to do in the ballroom scene. And um, I started thinking about wanting to make portraits um, that I can literally blow up uh, four feet by six feet. Um, and I was kind of tired basically just documenting the balls themselves. So now what I do, um, say in the last five or six years, all I've, I've, I basically go to balls and, um, and I take a backdrop and I have basically two lights. I have like a back light and a four light front light. And I basically do what we would, photographers and artists talk about, I do what we consider like Rembrandt light. So it's one light, uh, 45 degrees. And I kind of basically make images around all the different categories of ballroom. And also then I also want to take pictures about the, the people that are still alive who were there at the beginning also. And this this series of photographs um, I call iconic. You identify by name the people in these portraits in the book? Um, yes, I will. Um, you know, it's interesting because now ballroom is kind of like a global space, you know. Um, there are balls in pretty much every country in the world. And um, I want to make images um, of people. So like um, this person that we're looking at right now is from Italy and has a, the, Italy has a huge ballroom scene and he's part of the uh, House of La Beja, but in Italy itself. Um, this gentleman here is one of the, is the father of the house of Garçon in Paris. I don't know if anybody know Trace. Trace is a kind of like a superstar uh, movie star now. She has a movie out right now called Monica um, that's doing very, very well. Um, this is Tracy Africa. Um, Tracy, if anybody knows has seen Pose, um, the, the angel character is basically around Tracy. Um, it's interesting. I made this image uh, on Saturday and uh, this, there was a huge contention that came to the ball on Saturday who, were, who flew in from Taiwan. Um, 
and this gentleman is from Taiwan. Uh, we came to actually Vogue at the ball. Where was the ball? Um, in Queens, in Queens, New York. Actually, I also made this image of Junior LaBeja at this, at that same ball. Actually, this is the gentleman that got me into the ballroom scene. His name is Douglas Says, and um, he he he's a clothes designer, and uh, he used to design a lot of clothes for the um, transgender women in the ballroom scene back in the nineties. There's, there's a huge scene in Russia. This woman is from Russia. Um, and her her bride is actually from New York. And um, I think her, her angels on the bottom, I think, are actually from Philadelphia. Um, like I said, there's also a huge scene in Japan, and she is the mother of the house of Miss Rahi in Japan, from Japan. Ooh, I don't, and I think that's it. Um, Amazing images, really. Um, before we move on to our last presenter, does anybody have any questions for Gerard? And there will be time at the end for more questions. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead and pose it. Hello. Um, hi, Gerard. Um, so I'm a big, big fan of your work. And I wanted to know, what was it like uh, at that time when you first began uh, taking these images, building the relationships with the ballroom community in New York? Um, did they welcome you with open arms or like, what was that process like? Oh, um, I mean, I think the process, um, I mean, at the beginning, uh, it's funny. I, I, I joke with people the first, the first year of me photographing ballroom, I, uh, I literally only photographed backs of heads. I was um, <laughs> very, very, uh, I would say very, very petrified to a certain extent, but also, um, you know, I, I, I definitely wanted to, uh, continue this project. And then what happened was two or three of the really, really important mothers and fathers of the houses kind of like, I had a long sit down with them and they're the, they're the ones who in some ways made, had me come and, um, and they, in some ways, uh, allowed me in uh, the scene. They then kind of allowed other people to say, all right, you know, you can let Gerard photograph you because we believe in him and we trust him. Um, okay. So I think that was the thing. I mean, there, there's the, the three main people was uh, 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 the mother of the house of Revlon, Danielle Revron and and at right at the beginning of my slide presentation is the is the woman inside the 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 cab and then R R Chanel was another one whose actual ball that I photographed on Saturday and um and the late uh, great Hector Extravaganza who was also in that photograph with all the Extravaganzas winning that trophy so um I would say they kind of like said, okay, you know, you can, you know, let Gerard photograph you. And then, and then of course, 
Um, then my access then grew, you know, four or five years into it. Now it's been 30 years. And so it just kind of grew and grew and grew. And then, then I would say like, you know, people like Andre and Jack Mizrahi, they were other people who um, I would say allowed me in. Right. Um, so I think um, you had, you had to get, uh, I would say, okay. From the, from the, um, from the elders in the scene, you know? So. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, Gerard. And let's move on to our third presenter today, our final speaker, Ann Vetter. Uh, Ann lives and works in California and Massachusetts. They are a queer, non-binary Jew. Their work is focused on play, family systems, performance, and fluidity of identity. Their current project, Love is Not the Last Room, is made in collabor collaboration with their family, parents, brothers, cousins, and partner and explores gender and attachment. Vetter also photographs and writes for magazines and newspapers such as New York Times Sunday Magazine, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The Washington Post Magazine. Okay, Anne. Hi, I'm so excited to be here today and to be sharing this space with all of you. Um, I, in particular, am very honored to be sharing my work after Mariette and Gerard, um, who documented the communities that really lay the groundwork for me as a young queer non-binary oh. person to do what I do um, and to be a queer creative, in particular to be a queer creative, making work that isn't necessarily always the most overtly queer or the most overtly about gender in the way that I think... Um, the public wants to see queer work or wants to see work about gender. Um, and also I'm like, especially grateful to have my work follow that about ballroom scenes, because in particular, my work is not possible without the groundwork that was done by black and brown queer people within this country. Um, they really made pride possible. They really made queer expression possible. Um, so yeah, um, today I'm going to mostly be talking about a project or I'm going to be completely talking about a project called Love is Not the Last Room, which is a project I make in collaboration with my parents, um, my brothers, and my partner, Dario. Um, I began shooting Love is Not the Last Room in 2019, and I was about two years out of college. I had been exploring um, different project ideas without much sticking power or staying power because I had very specific ideas of what a good project was. And um, in the summer of 2019, I came into contact with a wonderful photographer named Jess Dugan, who has remained a close friend and mentor. And they encouraged me to photograph what I wanted to photograph, which was my family. Um, and in particular, my family in um, this place that we have spent time in for my entire life called Wellfleet, Massachusetts, which if you've ever seen the state of Massachusetts, it's like all the way out here on the tip uh, in Cape Cod. And it's had a really long history of artists and in particular queer artists making work out here. But when I first started photographing, I was just interested in documenting. I was really interested in following my parents, um, myself, and my brothers through the light, seeing what they were doing, photographing these things that I had looked at for so long. So this is just a photo of my mom right before she went swimming in our favorite pond. Um, this is a photo of my dad in our kitchen and the kitchen chairs that my parents have had since their marriage in the 80s. Um, and again, like I really was just following them and I was following the light. I knew that the deeper meaning behind the work would come to me at some later point, um, I knew to a certain extent that the project was a lot about leisure. Um, and in that it was a lot about class. Um, it was a lot about slowness and time, uh, what people do or what in particular my family does when they're in a really quiet, empty place. Um, a lot of these things were on my mind because of that. I was also thinking a lot about, uh, certain kinds of painting as being my main visual influence, in particular 16th and 17th century Flemish paintings, um, that kind of light, kind of pulling from that visual language to create these stories. 
um, from the very beginning, self-portraits were a big part of the project. I have been doing self-portraits since I was, you know, probably 13, 12. Um, and at this time, I was already out. I'd been out for almost a decade as queer. I'd been out for five or six years as non-binary. Um, but I wasn't specifically thinking about, oh, how do I present myself as a queer person? How do I present myself as a non-binary person? I was just thinking about, what do I do? I put my feet on the kitchen table. Um, <laughs> what do I do? I spend time in these spaces. Um, but then as the project began to move along, I began to get a little bit more pointed and interested in this idea of presentation. I've I've long been someone with a very subtle gender and queer presentation. Um, I can at times pass for straight if I don't talk. Um, and I do almost exclusively pass as a cisgender person. Um, and it's something that as I began to show this work, I noticed that people were either really excited and specifically want specifically wanted to label the work as being about queerness because I was a queer person or were very adamant that this was had nothing to do with gender, nothing to do with queer identity. And that was very interesting to me. Um, and something I had been thinking a lot about was uh, being assigned female at birth, I was expected to experiment with my gender towards a more masculine presentation. And I started thinking about like, what does it look like, for example, in this photograph, to put on this long blonde wig, to think about presenting more towards a more feminine presentation. Um, I also think this self-portraits a lot about my relationship with Jewishness and whiteness, um, which is something I may or may not talk about more on this project that my mom is Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jewish. My father is um, white Anglo-Saxon and my brothers and I have grown up with a very interesting and complex relationship to both Jewishness and whiteness. Um, in particular, in this photograph, I look at it and I think about um, Jewishness hiding within whiteness, the relationship between Jewishness and whiteness. Um, but I continue to use self-portraits within the work as a way to explore and play with gender and actually as a way to be present for myself through dysphoria. Um, so for example, on the photo on the left, self-portrait on Black Sands Beach, I was just interested in the way I was on the beach, I was making photos, and I was really interested in the way that my leg hair was interacting with um, the sand and what that looked like. Oh, and then, Jesus. you know, having a very feminine figure, but having very hairy legs, thinking about that. But this photo on the um, right self-portrait on table was something I was having an incredibly dysphoric day. And, uh, and, and for those of you who do not know, gender dysphoria is when you feel a really discomfort with like, for me, it's like you look in the mirror, what you see, like it can be a very specific thing. It could be your chest, it could be your hands, it could be your face, is out of line with how you see your gender identity. And it feels very counterintuitive to pick up a camera and to look at yourself when you just want to hide from everything. But I've found that through photographing myself, I can oftentimes mold and move in a way, make myself look more gender ambiguous than I actually am in my physical presence. Um, and my photographic practice has become a really central way in questioning how do I want to present? How do I want to be seen? Um, if I can make these changes in my work, um, can I make these, like, do I want to make these changes in real life? Um, at the same time, I became really interested in exploring my family's relationships to gender. And in particular, my brother, my little brother, Douglas, his relationship to masculinity. So on the left, I have a photo of both my brothers, my older brother, Matt, my younger brother, Douglas. And then on the right, this is just Douglas and one of his friends and thinking about, okay, people are so interested in how trans and non-binary people present our gender cis people are equally fascinating like cis people you go through the same processes of putting on gender every single day of engaging with gender every single day it just oftentimes is not as questioned and you know there's a lot of amazing discourse going on right now as people are pushing back against trans health care and there's a lot of trans people and a lot of amazing analysis that's saying that cis people also seek out gender affirming healthcare, which is like so true, another tangent to go on another time. But I was like, yeah, cis people are just as just as interested in forming their own ideas of masculinity, femininity, in the same way that straight people are just as committed to performing their own perform like their own identities of straightness in the same way that queer people are. And so I became really interested in turning that lens back on my family. While at the same time, 
I had the realization that I could use my little brother Douglas um, as a stand-in for me within the work. So kind of going back to what I was saying about gender fluidity of like being able to transmute my own body within the work or transcend my own body within the work that in these photographs, I oftentimes get to exist. I'm very lucky that Douglas looks so similar to me. We're literally the same height, practically the same weight. A um, little bit of difference is obviously he's got a mustache, but I get to see in Douglas what I would look like had I been um, assigned male at birth. And I get to see what a more masculine presentation be both at the same time. This is called self-portrait of my brother Douglas. Um, and this was a big turning point for me in the project of realizing that um, not only could I use my camera to help me see myself more clearly, but I could use my family to help me see myself more clearly, which is actually a reflection of how my family already is. I was very lucky to be born in an incredibly loving, accepting, um, curious family that has always made it their goal to see me for who I am and to um, celebrate me for who I am. And more recently, I've begun to experiment with photos of um, using Douglas as a stand-in for me without me at all. So this is also, I consider this to be a self-portrait, uh, but with Douglas posing in the bay, it's not a way that Douglas would ever stand, um, but it's a way that I stand. And it's a way that I would pose. It's a way that I would be, but he's able to express something that I find even with short hair, even if I'm binding, like really impossible, there's a certain kind of like security in his masculinity that like I yearn for and I get to see and I get to experience and I get to have within this work. Um, he still exists within the project as himself and I continue to explore Douglas's relationship to himself, Douglas's relationship to masculinity. Um, he is by far the most social of us. So Douglas's friends come in and out of the project in a way that no one else's friends do. But I'm oftentimes really curious about how Douglas interacts with other men, how Douglas interacts with even um, men in our family. So this is a portrait of, or a photo of my brother and my dad wrestling in the bay. Um, so thinking about like, how do they get engaged with each other? How does touch function? And my family, I come from an incredibly touchy family. We grew up wrestling each other constantly. So a lot of this work pulls from memory, but at the same time, um, it comes from my curiosity around um, touch, gender, gender presentation, masculine relationships. Um, and I find that there can be a great deal of jealousy within my own curiosity um, as someone who does not who cannot really pass in masculine spaces as masculine of like, I really crave that male homosociality and I get to express it through the work. It's one of the reasons I, my dad and my brother have become two of the most main characters within the work. Um, and then in 2020, I met my, oh, this should say Dario, me on the couch, 2020. Um, in late 2019, I met my partner Dario and, um, I began photographing him in 2020 in the project as it became very clear that he was my family and he was going to be in my life for the rest of my life. Um, and I became really curious in, um, in the same way that I was really curious about like, what does a queer familial relationship look like? I became really curious about what does a queer romantic relationship look like? And I have dated people of all different identities, um, my last relationship that was like any sort of relationship was with a cisgender woman. Um, and we were so obviously read as a queer couple, um, as opposed to Dario and I, who kind of, we pass as a straight couple. We look as a straight couple, like, and I became really curious about like, like what does queerness actually look like? And again, like none of this is as radical or as necessary as representation of like very visibly queer and trans people. Like, I think that is incredibly important, powerful work that is being done that is really important, necessary. Um, but as a very inward looking person and as a very like homebody person, like, and as a very like interested in the people I love kind of person, um, I became really curious about applying, like, this is a queer relationship. Like, 
can that be shown through a photograph? Does it matter if it's shown through a photograph? Like, does this photo still matter if no one knows that there's any queerness there? Does this photo still matter if no one knows that there's anything about my gender there? Um, and Dario's um, someone who I'm, it's funny, like I photograph Dario less than maybe anyone else in my family, partially because when I hang out with Dario, I don't want to work. I just want to like be with him. Um, but also because uh, I think that the questions that I'm asking about our relationship are so much newer than the questions I've been asking about my family, which I've been asking for 29 years to, you know, in conscious and unconscious ways. Um, and I'm really beginning to pick up the work of like, how do I capture Dario within this project? How do I share Dario within this project? How do I begin to share Dario's relationships to masculinity? Because a lot of the questions that I'm asking about whiteness and Jewishness don't apply to Dario. Um, a photograph of Dario means something very different than a photograph of my dad. And so Dario and I collaborate a lot on um, bringing him into the project, um, bringing our relationship into the project. Um, just wanted to, this is like a very new photo. I made a goal for myself in the last two weeks while Dario and I were together to begin to really photograph our relationship more um, as a challenge and um, as a point of collaboration and thinking about like, what does, what does our love look like? What does our care look like? What do we look like? Um, and also to like begin to bring in, like I come from a very playful touchy family. And I realized that the work was leaning a little bit too serious. And so um, I bring this photo in after that last one to kind of be like, where is this work going? Like what is happening in this work? And one of the things I want to bring in is like the play of performance. Like I come from a very pantomime melodrama family. Like I could go on a whole tangent about how I believe that melodrama is an essential part of the Ashkenazi Jewish experience within America. Um, but I will not. And uh, it's something that I really actively wanted to bring into my work. Um, and the other thing is, I don't know if you've noticed, but I have much shorter hair than I do in a lot of these photographs. And I've been beginning to play around a little bit more with um, what are moves that I can take to become more visibly masculine. And um, I made this self-portrait looking in mirror back in March. Um, that right before I knew I was going to cut off all of my hair, thinking about like what is gained or lost um, when you give up a marker of such obvious femininity. And I cut off all my hair and then I literally could not photograph myself for like months because I was in shock and I did not know how to look at myself. And um, even though like it's not that visibly different to anyone else, like it felt very visibly different. It felt very physically different to me. And so this is from last week. This is um, self-portrait in Dario's arms is um, it's me beginning to look again and think about like, OK, like I've I've done so much uh, within my photographs to show fluidity. Like what is how my photo is going to change now? as I try to use my body within real life to show more fluidity. Um, and I think that's kind of my fast spiel. Happy pride to all that celebrate. Happy pride to all the queers and allies here. I'm so grateful that you're here. And uh, if you want to get in contact, these are ways to get in contact. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. Really beautiful body of work. Um, I, I love the Vermeer thread through it all. Um, self portraits. So I'm I'm curious. Your, your self portraits are um, almost as if a person was behind the camera in the way they're composed. Um, just technically, how how do you do these self portraits? So both of these were shot. Um, like I just have a tripod. I have a camera, and then I have a remote control. Um, these are remote control photos. Like I will shoot. I'll reframe, I'll shoot, I'll practice. Like I'll come, like it's a bunch of adjusting and it's an incredibly uh, meditative process, but also unbelievably frustrating because it's a photo that I know, like, I'm like, okay, if I had someone else, like even if Dario was the one sitting in the chair and I was the one holding him, like this photo would be so much easier to take because I can like see how the light's hitting the face. Whereas like, I have to get up between each of these photos and like check. And then like, if I don't hold my face in the exact right way, like the light falls a little bit. But like um, this one I shot, uh, that's me in the pond with my mom, like Dario, I like told him like where to hold the camera because 
it was just too deep for me to have like the tripod in there. So I had him holding it. Um, this one similarly, like my friend Jess helped me with this. I told them like, I shot the photo of where, like, this is the exact distance. This is the exact, exact thing. This is where I'm going to stand. And I framed it using Dario. And then they put, press the shutter for me. But most of the time, like, um, like this is on the left tripod, remote control, uh, tripod, remote control. So. Well, thank you for that. You know, um, I feel what we've seen today is a, a presentation of the human condition that's been with us forever, the diversity of gender and sexual diversity and expression throughout history. Um, and, you know, fortunately in this country, it's become more and more accepted and open. Um, but let me ask a question of, of the three of you. I mean, th there's been a reversal fairly recently. And have you seen firsthand experiences where all of a sudden you start starting to question how open you can be with um, queerness? I mean, I know that a lot of my friends who are uh, reliant on hormones or who want to access gender affirming care are incredibly scared and incredibly nervous about um, about that continued access. Um, I personally have not experienced um, more discrimination just because, like I said, I pass pretty well and I'm in a straight passing relationship, but definitely a lot of my friends, a lot of my community is beginning to feel more scared, more nervous. It's becoming more dangerous. Again, it's always been dangerous for certain members of our community, in particular trans women of color, but. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think, I think, I think it's a, it's a kind of fluid situation where it kind of goes up and down. Right. Uh, I think when you're in a, in in the inner city, or especially in New York City, where I'm ma mainly in, it's it's um it's a little it can be at times easy, and then and then it can at times be thing because the the violence is very very present, and people who um, don't completely pass or um, can just look queer can be beaten up in New York City um, or New Jersey or wherever. Um, I think the good thing is, is that in New York, there's lots of really good nonprofits that do lots of amazing work. Um, one of my really good friends, um, uh, runs an organization called Destination, Destination Tomorrow in the Bronx. It does lots of stuff around trans. He's a trans man who runs the organization. It's a trans space and they do lots of amazing stuff there. And, and and with the access to health care, access to uh, figuring out how to figure out how to get a job and all of those kinds of things. And I think, um, yes, uh, a lot of times in the red states, you know, uh, thing, but what I think in some ways, the red states, ooh, I would be very, very, afraid to be a trans person in a red state now um so mariette uh, you need to unmute yourself mariette yeah 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 um speaking of which um it's kind of amazing the level of ignorance because all of these issues that are being uh, used to hurt uh, gender variant people, they were all sort of issues that were solved a long time ago. The physical transformation, all of this has been worked through all of the issues that uh, gender nonconformists have been uh, attacked on are things that are readily available as information. And so I I worry, it's more than worry. I feel very upset about the ignorance 
of the politicians, the evilness of the politicians who want to undo all the progress that has been made all these over the course of a huge amount of effort over the course of many years. And I think that what's going on is terrifying and is uh, it's beyond dangerous. We happen to live in a in a better area from that point of view, but it's catching up, as you mentioned, about danger. I, I know of uh, trans people who have been beaten up uh, here in New York. And um, it's like it's a spreading, a disease that's spreading. Well, thank you for the contributions on that question. Um, we have a question from Missy Parker, and I'll just read it from the chat. Uh, thank you, Paul, for documenting the LGBTQIA plus community. A question. Do you three artists feel more of the role of observer or participant in your photographic work? Hi, hi Missy. <laughs> this is a friend of mine um, who I've known for many, many years. And I do, do feel like a participant in the um long trajectory of uh, political activism of which I feel like you it may not seem that way, but even the course of photographing uh, just a single trans person is a political act for both them and for me, because in the past, it was all so hidden and underground. And I do feel, although I myself could sort of, well, qualifies as cis, um, I feel totally like I, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with the community that I have traveled and lived with and hear about, um, that the range of the community that is there and and the whole process of of progress, the whole progress, and which is um, you know being torn down. Yes, the answer is I feel like a participant. Um, gosh, I think at the beginning, I um, after thirty years, at the beginning, I, I felt like a as as an observer right uh, someone who has come into the scene now 30 years later i do also uh i mean one of the reasons why when i was showing my pictures i i, I don't i don't talk so much i want the ultimately the community to ultimately talk about the pictures that i make that's the reason why i did the video and i showed the video of junior labeja having the conversation about what it is to be a person in ballroom, right? Um, and um, after 30 years, I mean, I've photographed, I mean, I have relationships with most of these people. Um, they they allow me in. And, and, and partly, if you're part of the ballroom scene, uh, um, you know me. Um, most, I would say, 90% of the people in ballroom scene know who I am. And, and that means that I am part of ballroom, right? And, and that I'm no longer uh, an observer and that I'm a participant. And, and, I, and I, if you see me kind of maneuver myself and go through ballroom and how I think uh, most people um, would believe that I've always been here and, and always will be there. So um, that's what I would say. May I add for a second to what I was saying before? Um, <clears throat> I always did interviews with my photographs because I wanted to give the chance and the opportunity for the person who was photographing to speak for themselves. So I guess in that way, I'm, I'm outside of the community because I am not the, necessarily the person speaking. 
I think of myself as both, um, as both as a like participant and an observer, but I think of that like beyond just like queerness, like an into photography in general of like, it's a balance of watching and creating, watching and creating, letting someone do what they're going to do, but then coming in and taking a more, like, I think I probably more than either of you take a really directorial approach to my work just because it's such a different subject matter and such a different like way of shooting of like a lot of what I do is like co-created um, and like, you know, a conversation back and forth, but sometimes it really is like, someone does something very beautiful and some really beautiful light and then I'm just watching and then I'm just there but I'd probably pull myself to the level of like obviously participant because I use this project um to fully understand myself within the context of my family to fully understand my family within the context of myself and to create conversations uh between us and then have that be kind of like a conversation beyond just the family because one of the reasons I like I love all kinds of photography one of the reasons I'm drawn to personal photography is I think you can have really large conversations from a very small scale um like photographing something that you know very intimately can open up larger conversations around intimacy identity um and experience I think that's a very interesting question for almost any photographer whether they're just an observer or a participant and, and I think any photographer who's really making headway on anything in this world has to look at themselves as somewhat of a participant. Otherwise, it just becomes voyeurism. Um, any other questions from the audience? Either you just want to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Uh, Tracy, I see your hand raised, so we'll take your question. Just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. Sure. Hi. Um... Thank you everyone for your work. Um, my question is for Anne about your pro your uh, creative process. I know that you talked about, um, you showed the sort of diptych and you had um, the image of it. So I'm wondering if you also explore your um, masculine self through images that are electronically altered mm. or if it's, um, you know, the part of sort of changing your physical appearance um, tangibly is yeah. also, you know? Yeah, I haven't yet. I'm not very, I'm not opposed to it. It's just that I'm not that technologically savvy. Um, like I barely even color correct my work because I find Photoshop to be very, like, it's not that intuitive to me, but I am really open to it. I think that there's like um, obviously she's a cisgender woman, but I think a lot about Cindy Sherman's work now that she's moved away from a lot of like costuming and into digital alteration. I find that really interesting. Um, and I'm sure at some point I will explore it, but, um, I'm also just really interested, like, what can you do with a camera and light alone? And then also in certain cases, like gravity or angles or all these different things of like how, um, visibly different someone can look or like in this case I can look based on where I'm photographing myself but I'm sure everyone here has the experience of like sometimes someone takes a photo of you and you're like that's not me that's not my face and it's just because the light is sitting in that way or you're standing in a different way or the the lens is flaring in a certain way and I find that really interesting but I'm so open to digital or digital alteration I think that would be very fun. I'm curious. I think there's a lot of amazing, I'm very scared of a lot of AI, but I'm sure that queer and trans artists will begin to use AI in a really interesting, innovative way around gender. Um, just as like a, like a Luddite, I'm probably going to be on the, you know, the slower innovation side there. We have time for one more question. If, if there is one more question, um, anybody else? All right, well, why don't we bring this to a close? Um, why don't we unmute ourselves and applaud our presenters? Thank you very much. You all did an outstanding, extraordinary job. I'd love to see your photographs. I'd love to hear you talk about them. And, and thank you, Glenn, um, for organizing. You're welcome. Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This, um, this recording will be posted to our YouTube page um, in the next few days.
All right, so right. keep an eye out for future programs like this from SDN and um, see a lot of new faces here today. So great to meet you. And let me just say goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so right. much. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.